Welcome to the south of England. We have another beautiful spring day here today. Gorgeous blue skies. Welcome to my studio. You can see it from a distance right now, but I'm going to invite you inside in a moment. This is my commute to work. Two flights of steps at the back of the house. Past my favorite birch tree. And down to my studio. My studio has various zones, as I call them, and this one, for example, is a welcome zone where I meet and greet my visitors, where people can wait while I have a portrait session with their family members. Quite often people come to me as a whole family, bring child for a portrait sitting, and while I'm busy, uh, with that particular member of the family, others can sit down, relax, read a book, have a cup of tea and uh, look at my pictures on the walls and have an enjoyable time. Here are some of my favourite art books. I keep these ones near my coffee table because I like to look inside quite often. But I have many more art books stored around the studio and in the house. Here you can see some oil painting mediums, varnishes, solvents, different types of oil. I use them when I work on my oil portraits. Some of the pastels that you see on the walls do not belong to me. Uh, they will be shipped to their new homes a bit later this year. Others belong to me and are part of my own collection. They feature my children and other family members. Some of them are my student works. For example, this is a copy of the 19th century French painting, which I did a long time ago. And it's always been hanging in my studio. This is a very useful piece of equipment. It's a tailor's dummy. Um, some of my clients have complicated clothes, especially the ceremonial uh, robes and um, sometimes even private portraits have very complicated clothes with lots of different textures. So when I want to work on the garment from life, I don't make people sit for me. I borrow the clothes and that dummy wears the clothes for me. So I have all time in the world to study the textures and um, I do enjoy that a lot. Here are some frame samples. These are pretty much standard frames that I use for most of my pastels. Uh, they have slight variations in colors, as you can see. Uh, some are more ornate and more expensive. Some are more plain and budget frames. I, I always send frame samples to my clients before I frame their work. So we both know what frame we'll be using. And if, if they don't like my samples, I look for new options and we continue the process until everyone is happy. The back wall of my studio is the place where I keep my oil paintings. They're finished or nearly finished canvases that need to be stored safely until they're ready to be varnished and framed. The ones that are facing the wall are the portraits that I cannot show you at the moment because they need to be first delivered to the clients. Uh, some of them got commissioned as presents for special occasions. Some of them need to be unveiled officially, so um, we have to wait till the lockdown is over and the framer can do his job. Here's another painting that I'm working on at the moment. 
Ah, but I cannot show you the face. Now we're approaching my work zone and you can see all my furniture and all my equipment has little caster wheels which is absolutely brilliant because I need to move things all the time and it makes my life so much easier having the wheels attached to these furniture pieces. This is what I use for my pastel portraits. Charcoal, sanguine, white conte, and a few pastel pencils. Primarily the conte brand, but a few others too. Those sticks are conte sticks, and those are the only sticks I own. I do not have any soft pastels at all, and I never use them. Other things that you see are putty rubber, paper stumps, knife and sandpaper for sharpening pencils and sticks. I'll show you. This is, a, this is my work in progress. I'm working on this blue lace dress. And what you see here in this cup, this is all I need. This is all I need to create this portrait. This is a multi-purpose area where I have all kinds of things. Uh, stereo system, books, all kinds of souvenirs, a bottle of champagne that's waiting for my solo exhibition, which is now unfortunately cancelled. So I'll have to wait for better times. On top shelf, uh, you can see the plaster cast. That's David's eye. You know the sculpture of David in um, Florence. So that's David's eye and my painting of it, which I did during my student years. Um, more books, tea, coffee facilities. And this is a recently finished pastel that's waiting to be framed. And there you go. We'll wait for the framer to get back to work after the lockdown and then it'll get framed and go up on the wall. Yay! <laughs> I've been sitting here for the last half an hour trying to join you and I, I can't believe it was working. Svetlana Cameron from Southern England, amazing portrait artist. And mm -hmm. I'm enjoying so much uh, your English, like your British accent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can take a Russian accent, but, and you speak properly with but... I can speak with Russian accent if you want. <laughs> you can make me feel Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to talk about portrait painting today. We're going to talk about uh, old master's technique, what you implement to achieve that beautiful skin tone in your portraits. And uh, let me ask you first, uh, how did you start it with the pastels? Uh, it's an interesting story. Um, I'm not a pastel artist in a conventional sense. You know, I, I do not... For example, use soft pastels. And, and when people think of me as a pastel artist and they send me messages and say, what is your favorite brand and what paper would you recommend? I, I'm not really um, using soft pastels at all. I came to pastel after I did a academic drawing course, uh, drawing in graphite and charcoal. Then I progressed to oil painting then I became seriously interested in the old master's techniques and I started researching all the Flemish multi-layer methods and glazing and all the rest of it. And then I came to a point in my life when I could not use oils. There was a period when we were moving house three times in one year and I, I had a baby and then I was, uh, and then soon after that, there was a second child. So that, that period in my life when I did not have the luxury of uninterrupted hours for oil painting, 
and uh, just working in monochrome um, did not satisfy me. I wanted to work in color. So I started researching ways of introducing color to my uh, drawings. And that was the time when I came across the three color technique. It was, it was a lucky coincidence. Maybe it wasn't a coincidence. Maybe when you start looking for something, looking out for something, you begin to notice these things, uh, even though they existed before, you did not pay attention. So I, I came across some beautiful old master drawings in a book, in the exhibition catalogs that were done in three colors. Um, the artist used black and red chalk and black, red and white chalk on toned paper to do preliminary drawings for the yeah. paintings. Do you remember the name of the artist by any chance? Unfortunately, I, I don't remember the name. It was, a, it was different artists. Um, it was Italian, Rena Italian Renaissance drawings. Uh, that was the first time I came across that technique. And I was really impressed how the artist could um, uh, create really believable skin tones with such a limited palette. And I also knew from my oil painting experience that you don't need a lot of color to create skin tones. You, you can have a selection of four colors, black, white, red, and yellow, and you, you can paint a beautiful portrait with just that. So uh, having that knowledge and having come across those drawings, I decided to give it a go. And, um, and I started adding red. So I was working on toned paper. I know that, that Everybody wants to know what paper I work on. Yes. I just like to ask each other such questions. I'll show you right now. It's ordinary pastel paper by um, Canson. This is my favorite color, mid-gray, warm, pinky-gray color called Moonstone. Moonstone. And you can, Canson yeah. Meetings. Sorry. It's a Canson Mittens. Yes, just yes. Yeah. Canson Mittens. Canson meet them. Uh, just do you use um, like uh, gr which side do you use? One what has some texture? Smooth. You use smooth. smooth. Smooth side. Canson meet them. Okay. And yes. I yeah. Because I because I work um, on skin tones, uh, I don't like the texture. It it I find it it's in in the way. You know. Uh, so I like the smooth side, which still has plenty of tooth to hold the pigment. And um, uh, and I started uh, before that. I I worked only in charcoal um, highlighting with white with white Conte. I'll show you. Yeah. So I was using the Conte pencil and white uh, black uh, charcoal and white Conte. These were my two drawing tools, and all my portrait drawings of that period were monochrome. And then I I. When I decided to try this three color technique, I introduced red. Uh, it's a san called sanguine. Um, uh, people sometimes ask me, what is sanguine? Sanguine is sanguine. It's, it's a yeah, it's it's a a type of gray medium. Yeah, it has this terracotta red uh, color, orangey red, warm. Um, so um, when you look at my portraits, uh, if you look at that slide right now displayed at the top of the screen, the skin tone that you see is primarily the color of the paper. I apply my, the pigment very, very thinly, first by hatching, then I blend it with a paper stamp. If people are not familiar with paper stamps, I'll show you. Uh, they come in different thicknesses and um, uh, these are medium, but you can get them smaller and bigger in, in diameter. And these, they're made of compressed paper. And I use them to blend the pigment and drive it into the tooth of the paper. So it, the pigment goes in the dents and the, the, the bumps still show through. And the color of the pigment mixes with the color of the paper. It creates the optical mixing. It's, the optical mixing is really cool. It's much, much um, more yeah, sophisticated than your physical eyes. mixing. Yeah, you better viewer to do the blending, right? <laughs> exactly. And so by varying the combination of the colors, for example, if I mix red and black, I get a really warm brown color that you can see in the girl's hair right now on, on, on the top screen. If I uh, mix 
uh, white with red, with, with this particular red, uh, with sanguine, I get um, warm flesh tones, orangey warm, like peach color. If I want cooler uh, red, cooler pink, I use, uh, later I introduced this color and it's now one of, one of the colors in my palette. It's dark, dark sanguine, it's called. Um, and uh, if you mix that with white, you get a pink, beautiful pink blush color that you see in the cheeks, in the lips, in the ears, in the corners of the eyes, you know, all these really subtle colors that um, you have to have in a portrait to make a person look alive. Uh, so this is all I need to do a portrait. <laughs> I do not need anything else. Obviously, when people wear colorful clothes, like for example, the girl has a blue dress, I will of course use blue pastel. I always use them in pencil forms because I think it's, it's just a matter of personal taste and habit. Because when I was doing my um, training, the, the, the bark drawing course and the academic drawing course, we were using charcoal sharpened like this. And then I switch to pastel. So when you spend several years working with long, sharp tools like this, uh, going to a pastel stick, a soft pastel stick, it is, is almost impossible. You know, it, it requires a whole change of, of your frame of mind. And I wasn't prepared for that. So I started using, using pastel pencils and I continued to sharpen them to a fine point like this which really suits my technique because it's a very graphic technique i draw with pastels i do not paint in, okay, in this so particular the pastel drawing. we discussed yesterday oh, during the drawing. with olga abramova drawing or painting so your technique your pastel technique is drawing drawing okay we got it exactly right? And uh, so uh, with time, my palette expanded and I introduced lots of new colors, but not too many. I still, I still prefer to work with a very limited palette and I mix my colors right on the paper by overlaying them and then blending them together. Uh, so I do both physical mixing of colors and optical mixing by letting colors show through, depending on the effect I want to get. I'm one of those pastelists uh, in conventional way who likes to try all kinds of paper and need every single pastel stick what is existing like out there. So, and you're telling what you can do your amazing portraits with just four pencils. This is mind blowing for me. Uh, <laughs> thank you, so much. And you have uh, such a fascinating story about. Uh, how did you become painter yourself? And you have, uh, like, please tell how you, did you start uh, learning about drawing? That's <clears throat> very interesting too. It's a long story. We 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 probably need we, a separate we, we, for that. But I'll tell like, you we, we a few words about it. it. Yeah. Um, when I was a child, I really enjoyed drawing. I've been drawing and sketching more or less all my life, but. Um, it was not it was not a passion when I was a child. I was much more interested in music, and that took all my time during my childhood. Uh, I was playing the piano, and I was dreaming of a career of a musician. <laughs> but ironically, I did not. Uh, later, when I was in my teens, I realized I did not have a musical talent. So I I learned how to appreciate the music. I um, I still love listening to classical music. I do it all the time when I paint, but I quit music completely. And then when I was in the, in the high school and I, I needed to decide what to do in life, I got interested in foreign languages. So uh, this is where my English comes from. <laughs> I went it's my... good. You actually came to English speaking country, speaking English, that's like amazing. More than that, my major subjects were English, English language and culture. So I came to this country knowing everything about it, absolutely everything. Um, and uh, so it, uh, I studied German as well, but I haven't practiced German for decades now. Uh, yeah, but that, my, my two languages were English and German. So 
but then after the university, when you have the knowledge of the language, you still need to find how to apply it to real life. You know, you can go and teach, you can become a technical translator, you can... So I tried various things. Teaching was not for me. Uh, technical translations, I spent about a year doing them. They were incredibly boring. I, I thought I would die. All the volunteers who are doing amazing transcripts, hello to you. Thank you for doing transcripts <laughs> of our live videos. That's a tough job. Yeah. To cut the long story short, uh, I, I did further training in art history. And I became um, a qualified English-speaking guide in Moscow, and I was working in the National Museums. I could conduct tours myself. I could translate and interpret for foreign visitors. So I was working with English-speaking visitors in the Tretyakov Gallery, in the Pushkin Museum, in Kremlin. Uh, so... Uh, when wherever people needed to go and whenever they needed either an interpreter or an English speaking guide, I, I was doing that job. So that was my transition to art as a, uh, I became an art lover and I, I was reading a lot about art history and various techniques. And that was the time when I got interested in the old master's technique. Uh, when I was observing the masterpieces in the museum, I knew exactly what style I preferred and why it interested me. And uh, So I, I started going to the restoration uh, department and, and uh, learning more about it. So I knew very well what periods in art I liked and what I wanted. And then later, I think I was about 23 years old, when life presented me with, with an opportunity to learn how to draw. <laughs> it was, uh, I'm, I left Russia. I moved to Malta where I lived for about three years before coming to England. Um, and we moved there because of my husband's job. Uh, so as a wife who came with a husband to a foreign country, I had nothing to do. Many, many people are in the same situation. I had all the time in the world and I had nothing to do. And I thought, this is my chance. I want to learn how to draw. And more than that, I met a wonderful artist who could teach me the classical way, exactly what I wanted. He graduated from the Florence Academy of Art, and, and he taught me the it's, curriculum of the Florence Academy. Yeah, all the stars line up. Like, you have no choice. <laughs> no, I know. So when I was sitting in Malta being a housewife, I thought I would come to London. I, I knew we would be moving to London. It was a temporary thing yeah. i thought i would come to london and i will continue translation and interpretation i will i will have a career in linguistics but after malta and particularly after florence where i went to do a portrait painting course when i came to london i i was I, the transformation has happened already i want to paint i do not want to to do translations so that that's that's uh, <laughs> that's how it happened. I I know, and I, I like it started as a as a as a hobby of a bored housewife. This is how it was. I know it's a uh, uh, trying time for all of us, and I don't want to give that too much energy. But sometimes you see challenges, sometimes you see opportunities, and if you have a dream, yeah. then opportunity will present itself in one way or another. So that's why I wanted to tell this story because. Like, you knew exactly what you want to do, and when life showed you this opportunity, you took an advantage. And uh, in this way, I want to transition to the next subject. Uh, you had quite a success in U.S. too. Uh, in 2013, uh, you got fourth place in Pastel 100 and got amazing article written about you in Pastel Journal. So this is um, like... That was the first one. I've been in Pastel Journal four times now. Oh my gosh, congratulations. <laughs> so I did research, but I didn't do complete research, you know? So mm -hmm. that's even more impressive. And I'll bring this beautiful portrait, but the way I like it's spoke, so I'm kind of in a way of it, but please forgive me. So please tell about uh, your experience with competitions, publications, and you say you have a lot of to teach us about that and after that i will bring some questions from our viewers what i see okay. at the bottom of the screen so i started my art 
career, if we, uh, I, I date the beginning of my career when I, um, when I put in a, uh, my first artwork in a gallery and had a first commission. That was early 2005. That, that's, that's the start. I started drawing several years before that, but that's the start of my activities as, a, as an artist in, in every way. And uh, for a few years, I remained very, I kept a very low profile and I was very local, very much local. So I didn't send my pieces anywhere apart from a local gallery. And it was, a, it was 2011, about five years later, five, six years later, when I, I felt ready and I felt brave enough to send some artworks to competitions. And I send them, later I discovered that. I, at the time I, I wasn't entirely sure, but later I realized they were really, really prestigious high profile competitions for, so for established artists, you know? So I just, I sent my artwork to London to the Royal Society of Portrait Painters exhibition and it got accepted. Oh and I sent, uh, that, that was an actual real life exhibition with amazing competition, uh, 100 artists per space in the gallery, you know, 150 artworks from 1500 submissions and they selected me, which was amazing, amazing. And at the same time, I sent my digital submissions to the United States, to the Art Renewal Center, to the salon, and I got accepted there. I became a finalist. Amazing. So it happened almost simultaneously in two countries. And um, I was, was of course, overwhelmed. Was it the same work by any chance or different works? Did you know? No, no, different. Okay, different. So the one that went to London, uh, yeah, different. Is experienced artist if you send uh, two like same works because you don't know will you get accepted or no you may as well send same works to two life exhibitions in a different part of the world mm. and you will get accepted yeah of course i had no i i did not expect to be accepted to be honest and it, it was amazing and uh the the royal society of portrait painters sent me a uh, beautiful invitation to attend the opening night, and they sent me a press release. It was the first ever press release, the, 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 like the template, the, the, the where you insert your name, but they write the text that you need to pass on to the media. And I was looking at it and thinking, oh my God, what, what do I do with that? And um, fortunately, I knew a journalist of a local radio station, and um, so I, I rang him and I, I said, listen, I have this piece that's sent to me by society. Do I need to pass it to the media? Do I not, you know? I said, of course, you must, you must. So he said, just send it to me and I'll forward it to, to all the contacts. And suddenly all the media in our area wrote about me. The, the newspaper, the two glossy magazines. Uh, I was invited to the radio to do an interview. And it was just a small pastel portrait, a very simple pastel drawing, you know, that caused all that excitement because the local media like it when their local artist gets successful exactly. somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. They love it. Right now we're kind of limited to the internet, but um, mm -hmm. that's a good way uh, for beginner artists to start locally, start with yeah. your own backyard, yeah. work. Uh, with your local galleries and local media will support it. So, and mm -hmm. I have quite a few questions. So uh, how did you use that chance to get uh, further, like uh, freer? It, it, first of all, it, it really gave me a big boost of confidence. I suddenly realized that mm, I'm an artist and, and uh, big, Big professional society accepted me, and my picture got sold on the opening night to somebody I didn't know. For 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 me, for the beginner, it was a quite a decent sum of money at the time, and and I was totally overwhelmed by everything that was happening around it. So, first thing that it does to you is boost your confidence, and it's priceless because then you begin to feel in a different way, and you uh, you, you even start painting in a different way, you know. And also, uh, once all that media excitement happened around me locally, I got several local commissions, which led to really big, important commissions 
of portraits that now in the national collection of uh, oil paintings in the United Kingdom. I have three artworks that are part of the national collections, uh, three official portraits. And uh, I can trace that commission back to my, that my first success in a show. Uh, if I didn't send the picture to the competition, that might not have happened or it would have happened years later, I don't know. But um, I think it's very important to step out of your comfort zone. Sorry, it's a cliche, but, but it's true. You need to step out of your comfort zone and send a piece somewhere else for other people to judge it. And you may be surprised. Because sometimes some artists think very much of themselves. They have a big ego and they think they're brilliant from the very start. And there are the opposite extreme. A lot of artists feel very humble and they don't realize how good they are until somebody else tell, tell them. So I was that second category. I was very shy for many years and I, I was still feeling I'm still a beginner. I'm still learning because I did not have the art academy diploma and official education as an artist. I, I had very good education, but it was it was uh, done later in my life, privately, and um, through some courses, but not, not professionally in the art academy. So I was quite shy for many years and feeling that I'm still an amateur, I'm still learning, I'm still a beginner, until, until other people show me that actually you're good and you deserve a prize and uh, you, you deserve to sell your artwork for... Um, a good price, you deserve a press article. So I suddenly realized, yes, it's actually all happening. And from that, my career just went up and up and up and up. And uh, it's been an amazing journey. So if you don't participate in online shows and you don't feel confident, you will may never get confidence if you wouldn't participate in an online show uh, or offline show, whatever is available for you. So you need to show your work in one way or another. To Today we're talking about beautiful Svetlana's pastels. I'm trying to show some of works on the background and we will show uh, like you can see some works in behind and I will include them in a future video too. And let me ask you, who are your biggest inspiration in uh, terms like, can you tell us some names? You say classic artists, but uh, can you tell us some names? And do you look at the work of some contemporary or like living artists who inspire you right now? I look at a lot of art, both contemporary and, and old masters, but I prefer prefer old masters' works, artists from the past. And uh, I can I can tell you what I the periods that I really like. There are so many brilliant artists. I really like the 17th century art, particularly Dutch art of the Golden Age, because I love detail, and and for me that period is is amazing. Um, I like Renaissance art uh, and I like the 19th century European art. And when you look at the 19th century, the, the trends the, were pretty much similar everywhere. I, I've been to many museums in Europe and I, I see the same pattern as you go from room to room and you go from period to period. The, the progression is the same. So 19th century is amazing everywhere. France, Spain, Italy, Russia, Russian Pedvizhniki. Absolutely love them. The uh, up, uh, up, uh, up, up until the Impressionists and including the Impressionists. After the Impressionists or everything that happened afterwards does not interest me very much. Contemporary art, there are brilliant portrait artists I admire. Uh, and I do go to contemporary art exhibitions, but I prefer realism, as you can see from my from my activities. That um, I have a very narrow focus. Um, so, do you need to be a um, royal person to get uh, your portrait done with you? Or, <laughs> like uh, that would be a good idea, but no, you don't have to be royal. Um, I'm happy to work with anyone. Um, I'm happy to work with anyone who shares my vision. And fortunately, the way 
the way the art world works. If, if you produce portraits and you show them, they attract the right people. People who don't like my work, they walk past and they don't even bother calling me or emailing me. You know, I, I don't even know they exist <laughs> because we don't come in contact. People who come to me are those who are attracted by my work. And so uh, we are from the very beginning on the same wavelength. That's why uh, I find it fairly easy to work with clients by commission because they come liking my work and um, I feel a lot of freedom because I know that whatever I do, they like. Obviously, we discuss the details and everything, the composition and the... But in terms of style and approach uh, and understanding of color, uh, I know that it's pretty safe to accept a commission. And uh, um, I've been doing it for 15 years and... Uh, had a good experience. I know some artists don't like working by commission, but I do. I see two questions, what kind of goal uh, <clears throat> we would be talking about. So how many hours per day do you work? Your volume of work is amazing. So uh, Most of the time, most of the time, <laughs> from e morning till evening, with, like, uh, obviously with breaks. Day. Ten Life day. comes in the way, uh, and uh, I have natural breaks around school run time or you know meal time but but more or less full time full time but the life of of the artist does not only consist of painting time and the further you progress in your career the more demands on your time you have you have to uh, have time to communicate with people who send you messages you need time to maintain and update your website prepare submissions for the competitions and exhibitions. And I, I um, regularly travel to meet with my clients or welcome them here in my studio. So I have some days I do not paint at all, but I'm still working. I exactly. still have work-related things. Let me read the question. Uh, do you have more clients in England or in Russia? In England. Most of my clients are in England. Because I've been living in England for 16 years now. My whole career developed here. Uh, and I'm, I'm very much a British person now. I live here full time. This is where my home, yeah, this is where all enough. my clients are. Here, so yeah, I go to Russia once or twice a year and I feel like a the tourist there now. So the, the country has moved on so much and I have moved on. And, and you know, the longer, the more time passes, the more I feel like a tourist there. So, but I do have I do have um, uh, commissions from Russia, and um, I'm planning to develop that direction in my art. <laughs> uh, this, like, I see repetitive questions about soft pastel. Soft pastel is amazing, brilliant medium, and Svetlana already touched on what she is using some soft pastel in a details. I do not use soft pastel at, at all. all. No, I, I at all. Was a close. Okay, mm -hmm. I, that's that's pastel. Hard pastel. No, pastel pencil is hard pastel. Hard soft pastel. pastel does not exist in pencils. It's too soft. Hard I pastel. use Ponte sticks, which look like hard pastel. They're square sticks. Yes. Your mm -hmm. uh, they will call your portrait done in a soft pastel technique. And if you wish, you can enter our exhibition. So this is an oh, can I? But I'm not a member. Do okay. I need to be a member? Yes, uh, we would love you to have you among our members. I'm mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I just even lost my ability to speak. How happy I got! What you uh, want to join us? Uh, and I know some local members watching us. Antonio is amazing realist artist. He complimented you because he working in a, a similar style. Uh, he uh, uh, said hi, but anyway, in uh, Las Vegas or Nevada, there no, uh, wasn't pastel society. So when I moved there, I started one because like, I was too bored of being housewife. At our first online exhibition last year, we uh, online show because we just simply didn't have a big gallery to host us. Mm -hmm. yet. Like, why would you recommend anybody to enter online show? Well, at the moment, it's the only opportunity to show your work. Everything is online. But 
even in uh, normal times when when there are offline shows uh some shows still uh go online only and uh for example a really prestigious uh contest uh, the ARC salon in the USA it's been showing works online for years in the last couple of years they started going live in in actual physical uh exhibitions in Barcelona and New York but up until a couple of years ago they were doing it only online and they were still were classed as a very prestigious event um online show gives you <clears throat> gives you worldwide audience you are not limited to your local you're not limited to the people who will walk through the doors of the gallery you're open to the whole world uh you don't have the costs of shipping your artworks which is very important for beginning and uh emerging artists who uh for whom <clears throat> it can be an obstacle international shipping costs and insurance and packing and crating and all the hassle that associated with it it is not to be taken lightly you know if you're shipping more than artwork especially more than one artwork so yeah. online is a very good option for somebody who wants to expand who's just starting and for established artists as well for you know um it's not good to limit yourself just to to your local area you people it's need to go online to get the perfect uh, product you, like uh, what is your oyster so this way you can step uh, almost risk free on international art world arena and compare yourself with uh, artists from all across the world and and uh, you you never know who's going to see your work I did not win a competition for example but i got noticed and i got invited by um, a magazine to do an interview or there was a uh, author writing a book on contemporary artists and they needed to add a realist painter to their um selection of artists so they invited me so you never know what's going to come out of that uh, and you shouldn't ask underestimate the opportunities that it may bring i would say definitely it's a good idea to to enter as many shows as possible but with competitions uh, is yours a competition is it a selective yes, it, it exhibition it's a jury competition so very stupid jury. like it's a jury it's a selection yeah. they want to select certain works main rule there is uh, we didn't limit amount of painting what can get accepted because it's some line gallery we kind of have a suggestion but it's not limit so if you kind of following the rules uh there is very high chance of you being accepted well yeah. that, it's a, a board part and richard mckinley is uh, going to be a judge so uh you say you not always get accepted to exhibitions and uh, how do you deal with this is part of the game this is part of the game you deal with rejections and stuff you know if i knew the the secret of the perfect painting and the 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 secret of how to get accepted all the time i'd be very very successful now but at the same time it would be pro i would probably get bored by now you know if you win all the time it's 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 um you kind of lose the the motivation to get better so i think rejection is is a very it, it's a natural part of the game uh, it's inevitable and it's good it's good uh so you get accepted some of the times you have to triumph you, you get rejected you it makes you think what's important is not to not to get discouraged by the rejection and not to start thinking that uh you're not good at it you you, you need to quit or uh you're hopeless uh you need to it's imagine if you sit you sit down to play a game of chess you know you have a 50-50 chance you may win or you may lose and you don't feel like a a uh, failure if you lose that game you know you just move on and play another game so i treat it exactly the same way and it's important first of all to understand that um some exhibitions or competition may not be suitable for you for example as a realist painter i know that if i enter a contemporary art contest i will probably not even be taken seriously 
they look at my work and say, what is it? You know, some 19th century technique. It's past <laughs> it's it's been there, done that, you know. You can't surprise anyone with that. If I enter my work in a realist, realistic style art competition, I know I will be taken seriously and I have a good chance of being noticed and maybe even winning a prize. So you need to see where you're entering, whether you meet the criteria and whether uh, what your chances are. And But also you need to remember that you're being judged by humans who all have their tastes and preferences. And uh, so it depends on the judges. The judges change every year from in the same competition, annual competition. The judges change all the time, and you cannot predict what their taste is. Some uh, will understand what it means, yeah. And also, um, you cannot predict in what context your art will be seen. You know, you can take the same picture, place it in one competition and it'll look like a gem. It will be a genius work because it's around but by everything mediocre. Uh, and you can put it in a really strong show with lots of amazing artworks and suddenly you don't look so strong, you know? You, 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 you don't even make it to the final. And it's the same piece, the same piece. I have the same piece rejected in one show and winning a prize in another. And what it depends on, I have no idea. I can quote Richard McKinley again, my favorite part of the interview, if I can quote Richard McKinley. It's a rule of simultaneous contrast. So the same pencil like will look cool here and warm on a cooler Exactly, surface. exactly. So, the same with art, you know, you put it in one context, it looks brilliant. You put it in a different situation and nobody even notices. So it, you just need to keep trying and um, and and also, also uh, keep getting better, you know. Uh, it's good to compare yourself to other artists and see that the technique that you thought was good suddenly looks not so good compared to somebody more technically competent and with, with, with better, better command of the medium, braver approach, more balanced compositions, you know, so there's always room for learning and, and uh, uh, you should uh, always try to get better. And I'm sure uh, everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah. I see a lot of uh, women and kids portraits among your, um, like in your studio or on the social media. Uh, do you have a certain type or like, do you know what's your favorite subject? Or do we not know, like, what's your favorite subject or, like, what's favorite person or type of person to paint? Do you have preference? I I don't know if any of my clients are watching this. Uh, <laughs> no. I, what I'm going to say now, but even, even, even if they are watching, it, it doesn't matter. Um, um, my I am really passionate about the the technical side of it. So when I approach a portrait, I, I'm first of all motivated by an idea to try a new composition or maybe paint a new texture or introduce a color I've never used before or paint a person uh, from a different angle. So I always find a technical challenge that keeps me motivated. And to be honest, it doesn't matter who I paint, whether it's a child or a woman or a man, uh, young, old, it doesn't matter. I have the same amount of interest and enthusiasm. That's why I can safely accept any commission. I don't care if the person is beautiful or not. I don't care if they're wrinkled or young. Uh, I know that from an artistic point of view, I will be, I will find things that motivate me and keep me interested. So to answer your question, uh, the amount of children in my portfolio is um, ha has happened because uh, I was accepting commissions coming my way. I was not looking for children specifically and say, I want to paint this girl or mm, I need to paint a boy with a dog for this time. So this is not how it happens. 
I get approached and they say, I have a boy, would you paint his portrait? And by the way, he has a favorite pet. Do you mind if we add the pet to the composition? And there you go, you have a boy with a dog. And for me, from my point of view, that was the first dog I did. And I thought, hmm, I have a new challenge. I'm asked yes. to paint a dog for the first time. I'll go for that, you know. And then it, I, we, we, have a, have, we had a sitting with the boy and the dog. And that was a lot of fun. Um, I took hundreds and hundreds of photographs of both of them. Uh, and uh, so you have a technical challenge. What's the best way to combine a human and a dog? How do you show the loving relationship? How do you show the boy's joy? Uh, because he was so delighted I agreed to paint his puppy. He was, they were not sure. They said, mm, Svetlana may say no, you, 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 you know, let's wait and see what she says. And when I said yes, he was delighted. And I, I hope I managed to capture that mood in the portrait. Uh, so it's, um, it's a very complex process to do a, a portrait. And um, you need to genuinely love portraiture and love working with people to be able to do that. If I had to do portraits just to earn a living, but in, in reality, I would be wishing... I wish I could paint something else, you know, I wish I could paint landscape, but I have to do a portrait because I, I need to earn a living. Yeah. I would never be able to do that. No, that that's, it's not possible because portraiture is very challenging. You have to be passionate about it. So I want to read a couple of comments. Uh, there is your collector who is uh, watching right now and uh, she is proud owner of two amazing portraits. Alan Picard is watching us and saying beautiful ch children portraits. Well done. And Hi, Carolina. And is it Carolina? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw her joining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm very fortunate uh, because uh, my portraits take a long time to create and we communicate quite closely with my sitters and clients and we correspond, we visit each other, we have live sessions. Um, we become friends. We maintain that friendly relationship for years. And uh, I feel with each commission, my life is getting um, more interesting and I have more amazing people in my circle. And I'm, I feel very fortunate about it. This is amazing. Great. And uh, please tell about process. So like I heard what uh, it might take you a year or even longer to create a portrait. What involves in the process from the, like first time somebody saw your work in a magazine, gave you a call to the, uh, this painting hanging in above their fireplace. What, what comes in between? What comes in between? A lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work. Uh, so first you establish a contact, well, the person establishes a contact with, with the artist uh, and um, you discuss all the um, initial details like the, where it's going to be oil or pastel, uh, who is going to be the subject, where it's going to hang, why it's commissioned. Sometimes I get commissioned for special occasions and uh, official portraits to mark retirement and they're going to go in a particular interior which I need to take into account when I plan the color scheme. So all these things uh, and that can last quite a long time all these conversations and then when we finally agree yes we're going ahead then there was a life sitting. At least one for oil paintings more than one two three maybe uh, for past even for pastels uh, but I do not make people sit from life for hours. No, nobody's prepared to do that. Children cannot do it full stop. Uh, adults are too busy. Um, you know, people, those, those people who need a portrait, they're all very busy and um, important. And uh, So nobody's prepared to sit for hours and hours. So I, I had to find a way to combine life sittings <clears throat> during which I collect all the materials. I take lots and lots of photographs. Sometimes I do sketches. I take notes. So I equip myself with a lot of preparatory material. And when I return to my studio, I can create a portrait from that. If necessary, we'll meet again. But sometimes I can do just from one sitting. 
Uh, then goes a lot of work in my studio. Uh, when the portrait is finished, I send a photo for the approval. Uh, sometimes I have to half, have to show it halfway if I have a question and I cannot progress. Sometimes I just do it a complete finish. And then comes the framing stage, which again we do jointly. I choose frames that I feel go with the portrait. Then I show the samples to the client and they judge them from their point of view. Approve, not approve, choose another frame and then frame and delivery. Sometimes it's a, it's a wonderful unveiling event which becomes the highlight of the career, you know, especially with official portraits. You have um, visitors, guests, uh, it, it becomes an event. Sometimes it's just delivered and it's a small private event within the family, but it's always uh, an event. I think we're dreaming uh, about a live workshop and yes, it is. And are you planning to record an online course uh, with your technique? <laughs> I keep promising it and I, uh, maybe now is the time actually because I'm sitting here in the studio, I can't go anywhere. I've been here for more than three weeks now without going anywhere at all. <laughs> uh, to be honest, after my solo exhibition cancelled, I was going to have a large solo exhibition in May and for the last 12 months I worked almost without time off. Yes. And it was building up and up and up. And <laughs> uh, when it cancelled, I just took time off and I did nothing. <laughs> yeah, but now I'm, I'm back to my studio and I'm actually working full time. And I still have a lot of unfinished projects. I still have a lot of plans for this year. Uh, but I think this year I will probably try to record a tutorial. Um, I, um, I hope so. Any encouragement word for people who are still on the fence and uh, maybe thinking like they're not ready, like how did you decide? Are you ready to show your work or not? Um, you should just go for it. You, you, <laughs> you may feel not ready for years, you know, and just just send it to an exhibition and let other people decide if it's good or not. Svetlana, I have 15 mm -hmm. seconds. Thank you, thank you so much for showing us your studio. We are waiting for that little, like, miniature uh, mark making, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone, for watching.